everybody. Happy UN International Day of Peace to you all. My talk today about the connections between music and peace is just going to scratch the surface. I realize this is a huge topic. I thought it would be easy to write. It was not. Each one of you have many rich and unique experiences of this connection between music and peace. And I know at the end you'll say, but Hugh, you didn't mention this and that and fill in the blank. So you're right. It's humbling to speak about this. But it, it's also inspiring for me because I love music. And I think I've come to terms with that every year I grow older, I realize how much more that is. It fills my life, it fills my heart, it soothes and heals and excites me. Uh, I'm going to try to balance that personal side with some history and psychology today about music. I hope it makes you think a little bit or at least just explore music more. I'm going to begin by admitting that my focus historically is Western-centric. Uh, I'm going to speak a lot about the United States, but that's because very few countries emphasize peace through music as much as the United States. In Europe, a lot of cultural anger and political activity is channeled through books and theater and film and philosophy uh, than into, into music. I guess uh, Pussy Riot might be a notable exception. but. Um, what is universal about music is that it helps create community. Whether that community is through drum circles or church choirs or folk festivals. And another time I may explore the anthropological elements of that. Uh, one final caveat is that I'm going to be speaking mainly today. Uh, we have lots of music thanks to Rollin and I hope we're going to have much more music thanks to Rollin and others as we move forward into the future. I also hope that we have uh, more singing out at Rittenhouse Square at 6 o'clock for a sing-along for peace today. But this morning I'm going to honor Felix Adler, who founded Ethical Humanism. His vision for our Sunday morning program, he said, quote, There's, there is music as a kind of frame, but the center of the service is the spoken address. So I'm going to focus on the center of the frame. Adler appreciated music, that's for sure, as in the passage that Nick read back in 1931, the year before he died. He really believed that ethical culture and ethical humanism could develop deep expressions of humanism through music and hope that that would grow in time to face our challenges today. And certainly today, uh, as well as climate change, which is one reason why many people are up in New York, but world peace is a huge challenge today, and I think music can help us. Um, to start, I'm going to focus, I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to focus on the connection between war and music. I want to begin with what in Othello Shakespeare called the spirit stirring drum, the ear piercing fife, the royal banner of all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance, and the glories of war. Now, music can make war seem glorious, uh, and that's a problem. It's also used to convey tactical information on the battlefield over the course of history. Most people would agree with uh, one of the most uh, premier philosophers of power, Niccolo Machiavelli. In 1521, in his book, The Art of War, he explained that drums and flutes enhance discipline, marching, and also he recommended the bugle as a way to transfer information on the battlefield because it could be heard above the, the battles. He probably did know well of the Old Testament passage of how ram's horns were blown to help bring down the walls of Jericho. In ancient Rome and Greece, uh, percussion and brass was used in their armies, uh, including instruments that are now uh, have brought us the clarinet and the tuba. Music also accompanied poetic readings of Homeric tales of valor, which were used to inspire the troops. And I certainly can't forget the Celts, like those in Braveheart, who used bagpipes pipes and drums and horns to turn farmers into blue-painted fierce warriors. It was so effective, in fact, that in 1746, the English Parliament banned the use of music in the Scottish Army for a while. Maybe part of the resentment that Scotland's been building up over the century. I don't know. Give me my cat and my bike back. Uh, during the same period of time, 1700s, a new technique to gain troops was used. It was called following the drum, 
where enlistment recruiters would wander the countryside and through towns with a drummer next to them to get people to come and sign up for the army. Uh, this was used in the American colonies as well, through colonial towns. And uh, the Continental Army 1778 Soldier's Manual detailed models of drum beats and musical signals that were used in Europe. Singing was a big part of the Revolutionary War as well. Yankee Doodle Dandy, most of you know, began as a mocking song the British wrote about ragged colonial troops. But the colonists turned it around and used it to rally their own troops, increasing their spirit and their dancing. And in fact, it, it, they, to the chagrin of the British, it was sung at the British surrender of Saratoga in 1777, just to get, get the British back. The, uh, Maryland right now is in the middle of their huge 200th anniversary celebration of the Star Spangled Banner, another example of uh, musically inspired patriotism. Um, in the Civil War, you said both sides used music quite a bit. Um, I found one quote of a young South Carolinian recruit on the eve of battle in 1861 had attended a rally of music and for the troops, and he said, I had never heard or seen such a time before. The noise was deafening. I felt at a time I could whip a whole brigade of, at the enemy myself. So soldiers in blue and gray use music to try to increase their, their, their strength, and it worked to a big degree. Now, when we got into this century, when the mechanism of war got more violent, uh, Woodrow Wilson was elected in 1916 in part because he promised to keep us out of war. But the historical events and the slaughter made that impossible for him. And that meant that he needed a whole new industry of music. And there was quite a bit of it. Frederick Wheeler wrote uh, in 1916 a song called Wake Up America, which was trying to get shock Americans out of their patriotism. And then in 1817, a lot of those people who did wake up were singing Over There, Over There, that famous song, which encouraged Johnny to get your gun, get your gun, get your gun, with the words, over there, over there, send the word over there, the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum coming everywhere. Well, both sides were using it in World War I and in World War II. The Nazis, the masters of manipulation, used music quite a bit to raise the spirits. Um, Germanic symphonies were used quite a bit. Adolf Hitler dedicated a bus to Anton Buck Bruckner, a composer in 1937, and Bruckner's music was all over the radios to try to raise the martial spirit of the German people. In a diary of a young German officer in 1942, the night before he died, he also heard music playing. He said, last night I heard a performance of Bruckner's Ninth, and now I know what we're fighting for. Now I know what we're fighting for. All the speeches of Hitler didn't do it, but Buckner did. Goebbels, who was the Minister of Propaganda for the Nazis, loved Wagner's operas. Uh, so much so, this, this aggressive nationalism that the Nazis were trying to promote is so closely associated to Wagner that some people today can't listen to him because of that association. During the war, wounded Nazi soldiers came back to Germany and they received an Iron Cross and free passes to the Wagner Festival in Berlin as a way to reward them. And they did not hear the over 100 quote unquote unpure musicians who were Jewish who were banned from Jewish airways and all their music was destroyed. Now, the Allies, to the chagrin again of the Nazis, stole from their most famous composer, Beethoven, because the first three notes of the Fifth Symphony, yeah, I don't know, I assume it's the whole symphony, but maybe not. Da 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 da. Okay, that was used by the Allies because dot, 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 dash is the Morse code for V, which the Allies said is for victory. So you saw that tune and that symbolism turned around in a lot of Allied war films you hear, ba 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 And one historian wrote that uh, it must, quote, it must have galled Joseph Goebbels to not have thought of it first. <laughs> so it was a weapon. It was a weapon both in psyche and in, uh, in, in broadcast. During the war, Glenn Miller was supporting the troops with his music, traveling around the bases. Even Woody Guthrie, the liberal leading Woody Guthrie, tried to get the unions to support the war effort, and he began singing songs like Uncle Sam or I'm Going to Fight for the USA to encourage that. Now, I can go on with the military use of music, but the reason I'm telling you that is that music is powerful because it affects your emotions, and people know that. I remember the first pro-war song I remember, I loved, I 
was sitting on my floor listening in 1966 to the Battle of the, 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 Battle of the Green Berets. You remember that song? A rousing. Well, it, a few years later, I got a different musical appreciation of Vietnam. But that was an important song for a lot of Americans who encouraged us into South East Asia. But before I get into uh, the 60s, I want to talk a little bit more about music's effect on mind and body, uh, the psychology and physiology of, 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 uh, war, of, of music. I tried to read Daniel Levitin's This Is Your Brain on Music. Interesting title, tough book to read, a lot of science. Um, then there are self-help books that are easy like uh, your playlist can change your life, which I, I actually believe is true. Um, uh, but I was interested in the physiological effects of music and how certain rhythms increase, increase your blood flow, can change your brainwave patterns, can release chemicals and change your moods in many, many ways. And I often focus on the lyrics of songs for myself, but I'm just learning the power of pure sound, so to speak, in a way. One of my favorite composers, Aaron Copeland, wrote a very uh, sort of uh, layperson's approach to music, but he emphasized the, quote, sheer pleasure, pleasure of the musical sound itself. He talks about the sensuous plane of the music. He said, when you hear music without thinking, and for a heady group like ethical cultures, it would do us good to probably do more of that, I think. In this book, What, what to Listen For in Music, Copeland explores how instrumental music can make us feel a wide variety of feelings. He talks about serenity or exuberance, regret or triumph, fury, delight. Uh, philosopher Susan Langer writes a lot about music, and she talks about it as a significant form of communication, and that as a symbol of a highly articulated sensuous object. Langer is a philosopher and a philosopher of language as well, and she talks about feeling, life, motion, and, 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 and uh, uh, emotion constituting uh, the importance of, of pure sound. Without the conceptual baggage of language, symbolic language, music can communicate, she talks about. Certainly it can push more chemicals into our bloodstream, as I said. Dopamine can be increased by certain music, which can calm us down sometimes, some of us. I, I did experience that very radically. A couple of years ago I was getting an MRI, and when they slipped those headphones over me, you know, the sound sort of masked the whir of the machines, but it also just instantly changed my whole thinking about this. I, I actually did think of Bob Marley's uh, uh, words, one good thing about music, when it hits, it feels okay. You feel okay? That was true. Uh, uh, I, I thought about the concerts I had been to and that enveloping sense of warmth. And today, music is used to encourage healing, both physical and psychic healing as well, because it can raise our pain threshold, that is very documentable, and it can ease emotional trauma as well, which is less documentable, more anecdotal, like um, uh, many of you may know Eric Clapton's sad story. His son Connor fell from an apartment window and died, a young child. And he went through quite, quite a lot of grief, and he wrote that lovely song, Tears from Heaven, about it. And he was interviewed uh, by the Australian uh, BBC, or the uh, Australian's uh, PBS station, and he said in that, he talked about Tears of Heaven as being an optimistic song, uh, and it connected with people. He got over 150 letters a day from people talking about how much that song meant to them, because they had shared similar grief. He said, quote, the most healing experience for me is just to hold my guitar and make music. Make music that takes me away, that takes me away. I'm really interested in that concept of being taken away by music. It can move us psychically. It can almost feel transcendent. Some people will use that term. I'm using it in a naturalistic format. But it can make us feel connected to something greater than ourselves. It can make us feel awe around us. In this brain, your, in this is your brain of music, Levitin offers this relatively non-technical passage that I like. He said, to a certain extent, we surrender to music when we listen to it. We allow ourselves to trust the composer and musicians with a part of our hearts and our spirits. We let the music take us somewhere outside of ourselves. We let the music, the great music, connect us to something greater than our own existence, to other people or to God. 
Even when music doesn't transport us to an emotional place that's transcendent, music can change our mood. We might be understandably reluctant, he continues, to let down our guard, to drop our emotional defenses for just anyone. We want to know that our vulnerability is not going to be exploited. That is part of the reason why many people can't listen to Wagner. End quote. The danger of music moving us to do things that we wouldn't normally do is both power and a danger. And it explains why some people don't like to be manipulated by music, whether it's on a cheesy commercial or a movie or here. Um, there was a uh, Tom Flynn, who's the head of the Center for Free Inquiry, is a similar person. He's a champion of secular humanism. I've, I know him. He's wonderful. But he thinks symbolism and art and, and music can be downright dangerous because it can make us do things we have no rational reason to do, necessarily. They can encourage us to do these things. He points out that's what religion's been doing for years. That's Flynn's position. Religion has been using things, anything, ritual, music, and other things, to get us to donate to church, to shun infidels, and to join holy wars. So I can appreciate the dangers of non-intellectual ways of moving people to act. Capitalists know the power of music. They use it on me all the time. I'm weeping at movies constantly. Flower stores will sell more flowers if they play romantic music. Bar owners know they sell more liquor when the music is loud. You hang out in restaurants longer when there's a good playlist, right? So of course it's being used to manipulate us. Now, Tom Flynn is wary about how also music can call, cause what he says a false sense of unity. A false sense of unity. So he's got in his head a bunch of peaceniks getting together for a workshop, holding hands, singing a song, and then going back home and leading, leading their destructive lifestyles. So sure, I, I agree, that can happen. It happens often. Quite often it can be this, you know, oh, if we do that, we don't have to do the hard work. Uh, uh, 1978, one of my favorite peace activists, Bob Marley, held a One Love Peace Constant concert in Kingston, Jamaica, to try to ease uh, tensions between the two political parties that had been broken out into literally gunfire all throughout Jamaica. And he got, during his singing of Jammin', got Michael Manley and Edward Siego, the two opposite candidates, on stage, holding hands, singing. But the next day, young people were being killed on the streets of Jamaica. And a lot of people used that concert to sort of deprecate the, the use of music for making peace. It was called Little Woodstock. Uh, the Third World Woodstock, that's what it was called. Well, uh, the New York State Woodstock, which was billed as Three Days of Peace and Music, there was a lot of music, relatively peaceful, uh, other than the self-induced damage of <laughs> drugs and mudsliding and other things, I suppose. But as a historic event, it didn't by itself create peace. So it seems to be clear that the reasons why music can't create peace is that it can't do it by itself. Music is not enough. Because it's complicated. There are, people have different histories and cultural contexts and needs, and those differences have to be understood and negotiated through dialogue and education, not just music. And if you choose music, the question comes up, who's music? I mean, this afternoon at 6 o'clock, you're going to hear my traditional folky music and I'm going to try to bring in a little Motown, not necessarily successfully. We'll have the Peace Day kids, we'll do some music and some universal dances of peace. But um, it doesn't appeal to everybody, and I get that. Earlier this afternoon, Christian was going to have a hip-hop sanctuary here, and that's hip-hop's a genre and a cultural, a cultural context I don't know well. Um, people react differently to different types of music, uh, with uh, what might induce bliss and in, in one of us might make the other person's toes curl. You know, I mean, I, well, is Carol out here today? No, sorry, good. Opera. you love it. I don't listen to a lot of opera. So that diversity makes also the use of music something you have to negotiate through conversation. There's no disputing taste, but there is discussing it. I don't believe in universal music. The tonalities of music alone are quite different. In the Middle East, the scales, I don't know them, but certainly they're very, very different. And, the, and that's one reason why the call from the minaret might make some Westerners feel uh, 
sort of scared or, or odd or isolated, but brings comfort to people who grow up with that feeling, comfort and a familiarity. So if music is going to build peace, it has to be accomplished by getting to know each other as well. It has to get together with getting to know people. Because only then can I think we avoid the manipulation of false sense of unity that masks deeper divi divisions underneath. So that's one reason why I always try to use the expression in talking about peacemaking as building peace from the inside out. It's got to be from deep inside you to, be, to other people. And that's where you meet in the common plane. Tolstoy said, uh, music is the shorthand of emotion. I really like that. The shorthand of emotion. Uh, during the 60s, I was too young uh, to really be aware of, it, of the 60s. And, and even before it happened, what I do remember, my first sort of emotional connections, is listening to my father play Chopin's Nocturnes after dinner. This is something he'd do for a little while before he went back to his office to work on his physics. He was a scientist, a physicist, uh, and, a, and a wasp, not, not a great candidate for, for being a hugger. Uh, no gushing emotionalism from him. But those moments of music were really one of the most visceral connections I had with my father, just through the sound, hearing him play. So I still feel that connection with my father through music. The guitar that I used, it was his. And he would play it once a summer at a sing-along. It was another time I'd feel that visceral connection up in Canada. So those experiences contributed to how I love music, and that I really feel it from the inside out. When a song is deep inside of me, I find that it is humbling and exciting and cathartic to play it with people and for people. And little else allows me to express emotions in a way so publicly, but feeling safe and feeling empowered. I want to do more of it. During the 60s, as I said, I was a little young to get out on the streets, but I felt the revolutionary spirit next to my turntable. I appreciated how much of that music inspired people to try to go out and make change. And all that dancing made a difference, too. Emma Goldman said, a revolution without dancing is not a revolution worth having. I love that idea. Let's do some more dancing. It began, it began with the soundtrack of the Civil Rights Movement. I was too young at that point to realize how much of civil rights music was rooted in the blues and black church music for centuries. It, it, it began really with the slaves who came over who had different languages but had to connect somehow and found music a common space. Cornel West said, quote, we had to constitute some form of camaraderie and community and music did that. It preserved our sanity as well as our dignity. He went on, for me, the deepest existential source of coming to terms with white racism is music. In some ways, this is true for black America as a whole, from the spirituals to blues to jazz to rhythm and blues and even up to hip hop today. And the protest that's inherent in that music shaped the civil rights music movement. When it mixed in with folky traditions, it got a wider reach. So the folk mixed with the African American tradition, got people singing things like, I ain't scared of your jails and we shall overcome. And it got to a tipping point. Enough people, the new left, the moderate liberals, college students, could get involved with a broader swath of marginalized people in this country and use Gandhian tactics to make a difference. Now, uh, Gandhi, actually, I, I tried to find Gandhi because he didn't do a lot, but a lot of people thought he didn't like music because he was an ascetic. And he was so dedicated to intellectual ideals, many people figured that he was like Plato, who was also dedicated to intellectual ideals. Plato didn't like music because he thought it was too unrational. It was too, it would get people to do things out of emotions, and this was a problem. But Gandhi said that he could not imagine the growth of the Indian religious movement without music. Music he saw as very, very important to the growth of his own spirituality. Well, when, when the anti-war movement began to eclipse the civil rights movement, at least in the eyes of mainstream America, music played on all different styles, and most of you know it, from ironic to playful to angry to affirming, and they were all aimed at our war in Southeast Asia. 
Bob Dylan, in 1962, this is about four years before anybody really was aware of the protests to come, wrote Masters of War and Blowing in the Wind. 62, very early. And some of the lyrics of Masters of War, it seems like he was, he was, he was reading the future. He said, you ain't done nothing but build to destroy. You play with my world like a pure little toy. You put a gun in my hand and you hide from my eyes and you turn and you run farther when the fast bullets fly. 62. One of my favorites was singing back then as well, Phil Oaks. He went to many, many rallies. He appreciated the power of a single song. He was a great lyricist. He said, one good song with a message can bring a point more deeply to more people than a thousand rallies. And he attended a lot of rallies. He attended the largest peace rally in the United States, April 17, 1965, where he and John Baez and Judy Collins sang, Dylan's The Times Are a Changing. And they appealed to senators and congressmen to please heed the call, not stand in the doorway or block up the hall. Because music gets people to feel like they are in charge. That's very important, because we are, and we have to take it back. A lot of African American musicians began to be more involved in the peace movement. I remember the Temptations song of 1968, Nine, which was the number one hit, War. It's almost a catchphrase now. People say, War, what is it good for? Absolutely not. You had Marvin Gaye singing What's Going On, which is a plaintive plea to stop the madness, but it also indicated a growing sense of disillusionment in this country. There were mainstream musicians, even Bobby Darren went from being a sort of pop idol to singing the simple song of freedom. Dion DiMucci began with the Belmonts. I married his daughter a couple of years ago. He sang the song Abraham, Martin, and John which talks about our heroes being killed by guns, Lincoln and JFK and MLK. And when, Martin, when Robert Kennedy was shot, it felt like the lid was taken off in this country and things just exploded. Music itself got more violent in this country as the frustration boiled over. I mean, just remember Jimi Hendrix's poignant and angry, ripping apart of a musical icon at Woodstock, the Star Spangled Banner. Try listening to that and appreciating the history. It's difficult. And the violence seems to simply spiral out of control as the death roll increased in the United States. A few months after Woodstock, December 6th in Altamont, California, the Rolling Stones are playing Friend of the Devil, and some popped up Hells Angel bodyguards take out some cool, cool cues, a riot ensues, a young man's murdered, and that kind of marked this, the end of sort of the more optimistic phase of music and music is not enough. We hadn't learned our lesson. That's one reason why Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young had to sing that chorus, Four Dead in Ohio, over and over and over again. Pointing to Kent State saying, we haven't learned our lesson. Four Dead in Ohio. So we haven't learned our lesson today. We continue to bomb terrorists who are as much a symptom of a deeper problem as they are a problem themselves. But we keep on, and there's no real solution in sight. There are bad guys with guns in the world, as the NRA likes to tell us. I admit that. I'm not a total pacifist. But our addiction to violence keeps us from looking at better creative alternatives. And, you know, maybe singing out on Rittenhouse Square is naive. I find that. But only if that's all that we do. Peace requires constant creative work. We have to look for new creative solutions to what seems like intractable problems because the old solutions aren't working. Now, obviously, there are many local groups working for peace in Philadelphia today creatively. Lisa Parker's pulled together Peace Day Philly today. Please go on the website, like it, peacedayphilly.org. The groups that she's gotten together have inspired her to continue this work, like the Grand Peace Brigade, we'll show a film this afternoon, mm -hmm. the American Friends Service Committee, Brandywine Peace Community, the Philadelphia ch chapter of the, the Draft Resisters, War Resisters League, the Greater Philadelphia Branch of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and more and more and more and more. But I want to leave you as a conclusion with a few musical creative approaches to peace. Now, these are international groups. And they offer young people the opportunity to know some historical lessons, 
to feel a sense of global citizenship, and to learn to practice peaceful conflict resolution, certainly better than their parents' generation. And they try to use the camp as a way to transcend nationality and connect the kids to each other. Drumming and chanting welcomes them to the camp when they arrive. Hanze, a young Palestinian, wrote on the website that he felt, quote, at home at the first 10 minutes of camp. Music is like an enveloping hug, and when it's accompanied with smiling faces, it helps as well. There's similar thinking to a multimedia project called Playing for Change. Anybody know that organization? You probably have seen some of the videos. They, they take a song and they have people all over the world play it individually, and they splice it together into a video that's sort of seamless. And they use those videos. There are 96 of them on the web now. Look them up. Playing for Change. They make money to build music schools for kids around the world. There's also the group called Musicians Without Borders that help heal those places wounded by war. It was established in 1999, and they work with local people in war-torn areas to help rebuild civil society and help the healing. And finally, I'm going to mention one uh, peace activist who's been working so long, Joan Baez. Amazing. I mean, she's almost a granny peace per day by herself. I mean, she has been working for the last 50 years on it. I mean, she did things like she spent a month in jail for blocking her Oakland induction center. She was encouraging draft resisting. She even had to hide from American bombs when she was in Hanoi delivering letters to U.S. POWs. So she's seen all sides of it. She founded the Institute for the Study of Nonviolence in Santa Cruz, California. And she knows that people can work for peace better with a little music in them. She said, social change without music would be void of soul. Nonviolence with music, without music, meditation, action, and willingness to take risks probably doesn't exist. In my mind's eye, this is her speaking, I can see the black children leaving a church to knowingly be arrested, singing at the top of their lungs. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I'm proud to have sung with them and with many others in times of social change, political revolt, great deprivation, and with the attendant joy, fears, and sorrows. I want to have a moment of silence. It is exactly noon, and people all over this time zone at noon on the International Day of Peace have a moment of silence. I'd like to have one moment of silence to contemplate those victims of violence and war around the world. 